Straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. I understand you have reached a verdict as to each defendant. We have. The verdict is in, in the death of Ahmaud Arbery trial. What decision the jury came to for the fate of the three defendants. And the death toll rises in the Waukesha holiday parade attack. There are not words to describe the risk that this defendant presents to our community. We take you inside the courtroom for Daryl Brooks' first appearance since the deadly crash. Plus, a lengthy investigation into Andrew Cuomo made public. Why officials say there is overwhelming evidence the former governor engaged in sexual harassment. And later, organizers of the deadly Charlottesville rally are held liable on conspiracy claims. Brian Buckmeyer along with co-host Terry Austin. The verdict is in, in the death of Ahmaud Arbery trial. After a weeks-long trial, the jury returns a verdict with less than two days of deliberation. All three defendants are found guilty in the murder of Ahmaud Arbery. Count three, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Travis McMichael, guilty. Count three, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Greg McMichael, guilty. Count three, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, William R. Bryan, guilty. Travis McMichael was the only defendant to receive a guilty verdict on all counts. Those nine counts include malice murder, four counts of felony murder, two counts of aggravated assault, one count of false imprisonment, and one count of criminal attempt to commit a felony. His father, Gregory McMichael, was found guilty on eight counts, including four counts of felony murder, two counts of aggravated assault, one count of false imprisonment, and one count of criminal attempt to commit a felony. Greg McMichael was only found not guilty of malice murder. William Roddy Bryan received the least number of guilty counts with only six. He was found guilty on multiple counts of felony murder, one count of aggravated assault, one count of a false imprisonment, and one count of criminal attempt to commit a felony. The jury found Bryan not guilty of malice murder, count two of felony murder, and count six of aggravated assault. The judge began reading the verdict of Travis McMichael. Upon the first guilty verdict, Aubrey's father rejoiced in the courtroom. Count one, malice murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Travis McMichael, guilty. Oh. I'm going to ask that whoever just made an outburst be removed from the court, please. Joining us today is former federal prosecutor Gene Rossi and Terry Austin. Gene, malice murder, only for Travis McMichael, but not the others. Why do you think that is? Well, he's the one who approached uh, Mr. Arbery, and he's the one who pointed the gun. And I actually think this is the right verdict. Uh, you know, Travis McMichael is definitely guilty of malice murder. Oh, that, that one is a tough one, because you got to prove that he had malice of forethought. When he got out of that truck with that gun, he wanted to kill him. Uh, and I didn't think they had that, but... Uh, the jury thought otherwise. His father, he, uh, they basically cut him a break because he was in the truck just watching and, and yelling. Yeah. Now, Terry, many experts believe William Roddy Bryan would be found guilty of the lesser charges. Can you explain what the jury must have believed mm -hmm. he did based on the verdict? Those charges and the verdicts in connection with those charges were very carefully reviewed by that jury. They didn't find him guilty of the malice murder, so that makes sense. But as far as the felony murder, if you think about it, everything was in connection with the truck. The felony murder in connection with the firearm, they said no. But the felony murder in connection with that truck, they said yes. False imprisonment, they said yes. Aggravated assault, they said yes. So they actually looked at the evidence and followed the evidence and applied the law and came to the right conclusion. I actually think it might even go beyond that. Maybe they were actually listening to Kevin Goff because Kevin Goff's major point as to uh, his client, William Roddy Bryan, is that he didn't know that the gun was going to be pulled out. And when the gun was pulled out, he may not even have the opportunity to stop it. So maybe hats off to Goff in that situation. Many of us thought that he was kind of bonkers or crazy in some of his arguments, but he ended up getting the least amount of guilty verdicts or guilty counts, sorry, uh, as to his clients, and maybe that argument worked. We don't know until we hear from one of these jurors down in the future. Thank you both. And in other news, Malik Shabazz, daughter of famed civil rights leader Malcolm X, is found dead in her Brooklyn apartment. The 56-year-old died on Monday. New York police say Shabazz's daughter found her unconscious in her Brooklyn home. Right now, the cause of death is pending, but officials say it does not appear to be suspicious. Her death comes just four days after two men convicted in the 1965 assassination of her father were exonerated in a court hearing. 
As Law and Crime Daily reported, Mohammed Aziz and Khalil Islam were exonerated last Thursday. Aziz is now 83 years old, and Islam died in 2009 at the age of 74. And after 43 years in prison, a judge rules a wrongfully convicted Missouri man be released. Back in 1978, Kevin Strickland was convicted of three counts of murder at the age of 19. He received a 50-year jail sentence without the possibility of parole for the triple homicide. At the time, a witness inaccurately identified Strickland as the man who committed the crime. Years later, she said she made a mistake by identifying him. She later made efforts to free him through the Midwest Innocence Project. Now, 62-year-old Strickland has always maintained his innocence. All charges against him were dropped this week. After the judge ruled, the prosecution had the burden of proving evidence that undermined the conviction. Strickland's time spent behind bars makes it the longest time served for a wrongfully convicted man in Missouri history. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, the findings of a lengthy investigation now revealed into former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's alleged sexual misconduct. But first, the man responsible for the deadly holiday parade crash makes his first court appearance in Waukesha, Wisconsin. We take you inside the courtroom after this. With, with that bail, it's extraordinarily high, but it's an extraordinarily big case. It's an extraordinarily uh, serious case with an extraordinary history of this gentleman um, of fleeing, of hurting people, of not following court orders, not following um, criminal laws, not f following just your societal norms. Um, so I know that that's extraordinarily high bail. Uh, it's warranted here, and I am setting cash bail in the amount of $5 million. A $5 million bond is set for the man officials say is behind the deadly parade plow through in Waukesha, Wisconsin. This as a death toll climbs to six people. The latest victim, an eight-year-old boy. 39-year-old Daryl Brooks appeared in Waukesha County Court on Tuesday. Investigators say he intentionally drove his SUV through a holiday parade route in, on Sunday, killing six people and injuring more than 60 others. On Tuesday, the Waukesha District Attorney called for the $5 million bail, saying Brooks is a flight risk and has a lengthy rap sheet that spans across multiple states. At the time of the attack, Brooks was running from a domestic disturbance incident. The deadly parade crash was just five days after he was released from jail on a $1,000 bail. In that case, he faced charges for running over his ex-girlfriend in a gas station parking lot. Officials say it was the same SUV he later rammed into the annual holiday parade. Right now, he's charged with five counts of first-degree intentional homicide. At Tuesday's hearing, prosecutors made it clear a sixth count will soon be coming. Mr. Brooks is facing five consecutive life sentences if he's convicted on all counts in this complaint. I wish to notify the court sadly that today we learned of another death of a child related to this case. We do expect a sixth count for first degree intentional homicide to be issued or added, excuse me, to this case. I can advise the court that I am aware, I've been made aware through investigators that there are other individuals in critical condition. I think we remark on the number of actual injured parties in our complaint, it exceeds 60 people. There's a number of other charges that we are reviewing and considering, but certainly at the very least, we do intend to file a six count of intentional homicide there are not words to describe the risk that this defendant presents to our community. Not only flight risk, but the dangerousness that he presents, his history of violence, and the allegations in this complaint where uh, it is stated plainly that on several occasions, he was told to stop by police officers. They risked their own safety to try and step in front of the car to stop him. Everything was done to get him to stop, and he just simply continued down the roadway, causing death and destruction in his path. 
The court commissioner approved the district attorney's request for a $5 million bail, saying in a nearly 40-year-long career, he has never seen a case of this magnitude. The nature of this offense is shocking. Uh, actually, the detail I was not expecting here today that two, two detectives, not lay people, detectives, uh, not only tried to stop this, but rendered an opinion that this was an intentional act. You're presumed innocent, sir, uh, but that's what the allegations are. Um, and I've not seen anything like this in my very long career. Um, it seems to be a very strong case for the state. Likelihood of incarceration, which is the other aspect of bail, is absolute. If you are found guilty of any one of these, a multitude of them, it's a life imprisonment sentence that must be meted out. Let's bring back former federal prosecutor Gene Rossi and Terry Austin to discuss. Terry, as the death toll rises in Brooks' newest case, do you think the prosecution will try to cut a plea deal with him or throw the book at him? I think the prosecution is going to throw the book at him. They're going to have these five charges and maybe now six charges because we know for a fact that one child has now died. So the loss of life was magnificent, and the fact that it was so intentional, and the fact that he has so many criminal acts behind him, they're violent acts, he is a flight risk, I don't think the prosecution is going to go lightly, and unless there's some mental illness, I think he will probably be convicted, because it's right out there in the open. Yeah, well, there's plenty of eyewitnesses. There's definitely going to be some more video that comes in. It's a parade. People are out there taking cameras uh, and pictures mm -hmm. and video. Uh, so we'll see how that continues. Gene, as a former prosecutor, where do you put the blame when you look at Brooks's record and how he got to the death of now six people? Here's where I put the blame. On November 5th, he was charged with uh, running over his, trying to run over his girlfriend. Obviously had a bond hearing. I put the blame on the prosecutor at that bond hearing. I put the blame on the judge who released him. I, I put the blame on several people, maybe the pretrial officer. How this man was released <laughs> with that criminal record uh, after November 5th is beyond me, and look what happened. Yeah. I, I would tend to agree there as well. We, we know that his right to a speedy trial enacted, and they couldn't get that uh, process up and going, and so his bails reduce uh, down to five hundred and a thousand dollars, depending on the case you're looking at. And that, when you look at the seriousness and the violence of the case, is something that even myself, as a public defender here in Brooklyn, I don't see uh, in any of my cases. So I, I would tend to agree with you there, Gene. Uh, thank you for that input, both of you. Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, a hefty settlement reach in the so-called Unite the Rights lawsuit out of Charlottesville, Virginia. Plus, a more than 40-page investigation release in the alleged sexual misconduct by former... Welcome back to Law & Crime Daily. After an eight-month-long investigation, officials say there's overwhelming evidence that former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo engaged in sexual harassment while in office. Nearly 50 pages of investigation records were released this week showing Cuomo engaged in multiple instances of sexual harassment and other kinds of misconduct. The investigation found Cuomo created a hostile work environment by engaging in sexual misconduct with multiple people. It also says Cuomo used state resources to write, publish, and promote his book, written on his response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and that his office made changes to a Department of Health report to protect his re reputation amidst the pandemic. This latest report corroborates an earlier investigation put on by New York Attorney General Letitia James. That was released in August. That same month, Cuomo resigned from office amidst the sexual harassment scandal and an impeachment threat. Just last month, charges were filed against Cuomo in Albany County for groping a former staff member. Back to break down this report on former Governor Andrew Cuomo is former federal prosecutor Gene Rossi and co-host Terry Austin. Terry, the report outlines the environment created by Cuomo in his office and corroborates the sexual harassment. How does this affect his Albany County case? And could we see more women coming forward? 
No question about it. This report is definitely going to have an adverse effect on the criminal case. Now we have two reports. The first, as you mentioned, by Letitia James and now by the State Assembly, saying basically that he created a hostile work environment, that he definitely participated in sexual harassment as far as multiple women are concerned. So I believe that we are going to see that information down the line in the criminal investigation and in the criminal case. So these aren't going to help him one bit. Now, Gene, this report goes beyond sexual allegations. Do you see any other potential criminal charges, whether they be state or federal, for Cuomo? Well, in the light most unfavorable to Governor Cuomo, <clears throat> he could be facing a RICO charge because the office of the governor could be the enterprise, and you could have at least two predicate acts. It could be mail fraud, wire fraud. Now, if he's using campaign funds to impermissibly promote his book for personal use, that could be wire fraud, mail fraud, bank fraud, and you could use the enterprise of the office of the governor uh, to, to lay that charge on him. That's the worst he could face. Well, it's interesting because we saw RICO charges used in a similar fashion with R. Kelly in the EDNY. Typically, we think of RICO as like a drug campaigns. So maybe we'll see um, the former king of R&B getting convicted of RICO charges. And now, maybe the same thing happens to the former governor of New York, as you've outlined there. Of course, we'll follow the case and we'll follow the facts first and see if that does, in fact, come up. And we'll be sure to report it here on Law & Crime Daily. An update now on a story we first brought you on Law & Crime Daily. Los Angeles County wants the lawsuit filed by Vanessa Bryant thrown out. The widow of basketball legend Kobe Bryant filed a lawsuit against the county last year claiming severe emotional distress and invasion of privacy after photos of the crash taken by Los Angeles County workers were leaked. In January 2020, Kobe Bryant, his 13-year-old daughter Gianna and seven other people died in the helicopter crash. On Monday, L.A. County asked that the lawsuit be dismissed, saying that because the photos weren't shared to the general public, Vanessa Bryant's harm would be, quote, hypothetical. They also allege Bryant has never seen the photos. This comes after a judge ordered Bryant to turn over her mental health records dating back to 2017 as part of the lawsuit. Bryant has until November 29th to hand in those records. When we come back, a victory for the victims of the 2017 Charlottesville rally how much the organizers are ordered to pay out, and what charges they were found liable for. All that and more after the break. And a monumental victory in the so-called Unite the Rights lawsuit as rally organizers are found liable in the deadly Charlottesville riots. This as they're ordered to pay more than $25 million to those affected by the fallout. The jury found all two dozen defendants liable for conspiracy and racial, religious, or ethnic harassment. This stems from the so-called Unite the Right rally in August of 2017 when white supremacist groups gathered to demonstrate in Charlottesville, Virginia. The rally was in response to the removal of Confederate symbols by local governments that followed the Charlottesville church shooting in 2015. During the rally, a self-identified white supremacist rammed his car into a crowd of counter-protesters. One woman died, and dozens others were injured. Two Virginia state troopers also died in a helicopter crash that was assisting with public safety. After nearly one month long federal trial, the jury determined rally organizers were liable on a state conspiracy claim. They did not reach a verdict on two federal conspiracy claims, but attorneys for the plaintiffs say they intend to get a verdict on those counts in the future. Gene, what message do you think this verdict sends to future political assemblies that could turn violent? If you hate, if you organize hate, if you encourage violence, uh, forget the criminal laws, you're subject to those, uh, you could be sued civilly and you'll have to pay, you'll get a judgment against you. It's a great day, it's a great case, and uh, one of the lead attorneys, Karen Dunn, I worked with her when we were both in the U.S. Attorney's Office she is a brilliant litigator. I'm very happy and proud of her. Now, this is one of the many shortcomings, I think, of federal court. I wish we had a camera in there so we can see the brilliance of this litigation and be able to spell this out better for our viewers. But unfortunately, the federal government hasn't got to where many states are in terms of transparency in the court. And Terry, that kind of leads me to my next question. I can already imagine people claiming a double standard between this Charlottesville 
and riots like what happened in Kenosha. What do you think the difference is between this case and other protests that turn violent? Well, I think the difference here, Brian, is the fact that the organizers of this protest, the white nationalists, actually were individuals who were promoting this violence, and people ultimately died. Most protests, you have, obviously, a First Amendment right to speak, but you don't have a right to go in and have a violent response when you are really trying to say some sort of message. Clearly, it's a message that most people don't believe in, but you have a right to say that. But you cannot go out, like Jean said, and promote that sort of violence. And hopefully it does send a message to people out there that you have to be responsible, you have to be organized, but you have to make sure that violence doesn't result as when you are doing these types of protests. So I think it was a great decision. Well, thank you very much, Terry, and thank you, Jean, as always. And thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.